everyone. It's good to see all these lovely faces. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the fact that we are able to come before you and address you as our Father. For those of us who have turned from our sins and trusted in your Son and his atoning sacrifice for our sins on the cross, we thank you that we are no longer your enemies, that we are no longer rebel sinners against you, and that's not how you view us, but that now we are your children, that now we are your friends, and that, Lord, we are co-heirs with your Son of a future coming kingdom. We thank you for that great reality and thank you that we have the joy even here on this earth as we await the return of King Jesus to, Lord, enjoy singing of praises and adoring you through our words. I pray that that might be done in spirit and in truth. Father, I pray at this time that you would remove distractions from our hearts and from our minds, from our thoughts. We come in, many of us, every single one of us carrying baggage Lord, from this week and the busyness of life and prevailing sins in our lives and perhaps even interpersonal conflict with other people within the home or outside of the home, Father, I pray that we would be people who would hear your word this morning, that we would behold Christ again, and that, Lord, we might see the implications of even a higher view of Christ for all of those areas of our life, so that we might live victoriously. We know that we stand victorious already because of what Christ has done on the cross, you don't love us, Lord, any more based upon our performance. Jesus has already, Lord, gained your approval. And for those of us who have trusted in Jesus, we are clothed in his righteousness, assured of our salvation. And yet, Lord, we oftentimes don't live that way. And I pray, Father, that you by your spirit would empower us this morning to, Lord, be again renewed in the spirit of our minds to remember that you have called us to be on mission on this earth sharing the message of your son with people who don't know him, as well as edifying, building up our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45 is our text for this morning. And if you don't have a Bible, make sure that you, there, there are Bibles directly in front of you, make sure that you open up a copy of God's Word or you turn on a copy of God's Word, right? iPhones and iPads and laptops and all of that, that, that's okay. But make sure that you do have a copy of God's Word in front of you. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. This is the Word of the living God. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he sternly, sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. This is the word of the living God. This uh, uh, particular miracle here takes place, if you remember, during the tour in and around Galilee that Jesus and his disciples have embarked upon. Jesus, in verse 38, told his disciples... Let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And that was on the heels of people just flocking to see Jesus in, in and around Capernaum, where really it became his headquarters. And he is so, so many people are coming to Christ that Jesus has to remind his disciples that his ultimate purpose was not even the miracles themselves, but to preach and teach the gospel concerning the kingdom of God. And so they're on this tour right now, visiting various cities throughout the region of Galilee, and this is one of the great miracles that Mark pens in his gospel that must be remembered about that tour, the healing of a leper by Jesus Christ. But we've already seen throughout the first chapter of Mark, haven't we, that Mark wants to present the fact that Jesus is this one who is an extraordinary person, 
We've already seen in chapter 1 how this is the, Jesus is the one who fulfills Old Testament scripture concerning the coming of this Messiah from hundreds and hundreds of years before. There have been promises concerning this one that would come that would be announced by a forerunner who now we know in Mark chapter 1 is none other than John the Baptist. And so Jesus is no ordinary person, but he's the one who comes in fulfillment of that Old Testament prophecy and the one who's announced by John the Baptist. We see the fact that Jesus is an extraordinary person and that he's, he's publicly affirmed, isn't he, by his father upon his uh, baptism in chapter 1 and then empowered by the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus to empower him for his ministry. We see that Jesus is an extraordinary person in the fact that he's, he's victorious over his cardinal arch enemy, Satan, in chapter 1 at the, and the temptation of Jesus as we know it. We see that he's an extraordinary person and that he comes ministering a, a message of hope to people, the gospel of his father's kingdom, and that people who embrace this good news concerning himself as the king can have hope beyond this life. So Mark is showing us that Jesus is no ordinary person. But the other big theme that we see in chapter 1 here and into chapter 2 in this mini-series that we've been doing within the Gospel of Mark is Mark showing us that Jesus is unrivaled in authority. He's unrivaled in authority. No one compares to Jesus. No one has ever done the things that Jesus did. No one ever spoke the way that Jesus spoke. Jesus has authority over human history in that nothing thwarted his plan. Though nations came and nations went and individuals came and individuals went and rulers arose and rulers were eliminated, Jesus still fulfilled hum the promises of God in human history by coming up to earth as the long-awaited Messiah. He is sovereign. He still came. He's also unrivaled in authority and his authority over Satan, overcoming 30 plus years, beloved, before he comes public in chapter one of testings by Satan and the kingdom of darkness so that he never sinned. He was blameless and perfect. And then at the temptation for 40 days and 40 nights, all day long, he experienced the onslaughts of Satan, and yet Jesus stood strong and was victorious over Satan. He's unrivaled in his authority, and he's unrivaled in human hearts. He calls people in chapter 1, verses 14 and following, brothers who hear his message to follow him, and when Jesus calls people, they drop everything to follow after him. He's a th he has authority over human lives. He shows his authority by his words. If you notice in chapter 1, verse 22, when he's speaking in the synagogue to people, it says in chapter 1, verse 22, that they were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having what? Authority, and not as the scribes. Look at verse 27. They were all amazed after he cast out the demon as well, so that they debated amongst themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with what? Authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And then look in chapter 2 and verse 12. This is after healing a paralytic that we're going to see next week as to what is forgiving him of his sins. And in chapter 2 verse 12 it says that he got up and immediately picked up the pallet, the paralytic, and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and glorifying God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Jesus' works, Jesus' words were authoritative, and he used his unrivaled authority to do good, to benefit people, right, during his lifetime. He shows his authority over the spiritual realm, over demons, over the physical realm, all kinds of human diseases. He's healing people of all kinds, variegated diseases in chapter 1, including severe fevers, like Simon Peter's mother-in-law had. He's healing hundreds and hundreds of people. And beloved, I want us to be reminded that Jesus' words and Jesus' works were all designed to validate his claims concerning his identity as the Son of God who came to take away the sin of the world. Everything that Jesus did, his miracles and his signs were attesting miracles meant to point to his claims of who he was because if people didn't understand who he was, they wouldn't be able to embrace what he came to do to die for their sins. And I want you to see this as we fast forward just for a minute to chapter 8 of Mark. This is kind of where we're heading as far as the hinge or turning point in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. 
everything that Jesus did and everything that he said was meant to point people to who he was. And here we find the ultimate explicit question by, of Jesus to his disciples concerning who he is. Look at verse 27. It says, Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And listen to this. On the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, who do people say that I am? This is the first time, as, as far as the Gospel of Mark goes, that Jesus explicitly asks his disciples, what is the popular opinion about me? You remember before, over and over again, we're going to see it even in our passage, he keeps telling people to be quiet. He keeps telling demons to be quiet, that they are, that they are professing true things about his identity. But now he explicitly asks his disciples, what's the popular opinion about me? And they give him the various opinions and he continued in verse 29, if you notice, by questioning them, meaning his disciples now, but who do you say that I am? I don't want to know what the popular opinion is anymore. I want to know who do you, my, my core group of followers, who do you say that I am? And then the ultimate confession, right? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And I think Matthew says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the ultimate confession from the mouth of Peter, who is the spokesman for the other disciples. And this is exactly what Jesus had been training his disciples to get to that point where they saw him for who he was, the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And notice in verse 30, and he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began, verse 31, to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly concerning his purpose to die on the cross. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But notice, it wasn't until Jesus, um, until the, this confession was made about his identity that now Jesus begins to tell the disciples, this is what I'm going to go do. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die on the cross. But three days later, I'm going to rise again. And two or three other times as after chapter 8, after that passage in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is explicitly telling the disciples, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to the cross. And after that turning point passage, I mean, he is resolute on heading to Jerusalem to die on the cross for sinners. So keep that in mind as we continue to look at these miracles and these signs. Jesus, through everything that he does, including this healing of this leper man in our passage this morning, is trying to get his disciples and people to recognize that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, because if they don't understand who he is, then they don't understand that he's the only one who qualifies to go to the cross and die for their sins, right? That's the purpose. That's the purpose. So here in Mark, chapter one, verses 40 through 45, we behold our suffering servant, savior Jesus again, don't we? We behold here in verses 40 through 45, the one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has all authority over human disease, devastating human disease. That's the main point of verses 40 through 45, to point to Jesus' identity as the one who has all authority, unrivaled authority over human disease. And beloved, that, us seeing this passage and seeing Jesus' authority must evoke a response in us. Mark doesn't write here just to give us information, factual information, intellectual information about this suffering servant savior. As we behold Jesus in the pages of the gospel of Mark, for us who are believers, it should evoke in us a response of, of greater worship, of greater service for our Lord Jesus Christ, of greater appreciation for what he has done, of greater love and endearment to him, amen? And for those of you who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, who are not Christians. As we behold, even in this passage, Jesus' authority over human disease, which should, this should move you to give your life to this one who is worthy of you living for him. What should be, you should be moved to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. You know why? Because what you do with Jesus as a non-believer has eternal consequence for your own soul, right? 
Jesus, the claims that Jesus had here in the Gospel of Mark, the things that he said concerning himself and what he went to the cross and do has a direct bearing upon where you will spend eternity. And right now, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you are on the path headed for hell. You are on the path of destruction. And one day, when you stand before God, your maker, the greatest question that you will have to answer is not how great of a sinner you were or how devastating of sins you committed so that God can't let you into his heaven because of how great of a sinner you were, but the biggest thing that he's going to want to know from you is, what did you do with my son? Did you believe in him? Did you trust him? Did you embrace him? Did you turn from your sins and believe in him? So I want us to be reminded of this. That we don't just come to the Gospel of Mark, beloved, simply to just grow in knowledge without it impacting our affections and moving us to greater worship as believers. Amen? Now we see Jesus' authority over human disease here in this passage in four movements that we have here. And the first one is this in verse 40. There are four movements. The first one is, notice the leper's plight. The leper's plight here. This leper had a great affliction. He was a man in great suffering. Notice, it says in verse 40 that a leper came to Jesus. A leper came to Jesus. In ancient times, leprosy was a very common and greatly feared disease by people. There were all kinds of leprosy. By the time of Jesus, in fact, religious leaders had identified more than 70 skin-related problems under the umbrella of leprosy. If you can imagine that. But here, what we have in this passage is a, is a severe, full-blown case of leprosy with this leper here. Luke chapter 5, verse 12. You know that Luke, writing in his gospel, the parallel account, he's a physician. He's a doctor. He labels this, this leper here as a man covered with leprosy. He was a man full of leprosy. He had a full-blown case of it, in other words. The type of leprosy that rendered this man by his, by his own admission unclean because he requests from Jesus to clean him. He was ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. So he had a severe case of leprosy and most likely he was severely disfigured. He was decaying in his flesh. He was rotting out as lepers would, especially in severe cases. Now the root cause for leprosy was unknown at the time. But we now know that the cause of the disease is a slow developing bacteria that attacks the nerves of a, or the nervous system of a person's skin and below the skin. Essentially, it was a disease of the nervous system. Most medical experts believe that ancient leprosy is, is what we know now as Hansen's disease after the scientists who discovered the bacteria in 1873. Now, there's so much debate over that, whether Hansen's really represents the, the wide spectrum of, the, of New Testament leprosy. We just really can't know. But biblical leprosy is probably much broader than Hansen's disease, okay? Now, if contracted, this bacteria had horrifying effects in that it attacked a person's nervous system, resulting in the loss of sensation and a person's ability to feel pain. In fact, if you're curious, there was a guy by the name of Dr. Paul Brand, who was an orthopedic surgeon, who passed away in 2003 at the age of 88, who did extensive research on the causes of various deformities and skin uh, decaying in leprosy patients. And what Dr. Paul Brand found after extensive study, what he concluded was that these deformities and this de uh, physical decaying were not due to the infection itself of the disease-causing bacteria, but came from the secondary result of the loss of pain, the loss of sensation, the loss of feeling in a person, so that it resulted in severe nerve damage in leprosy patients. In fact, he later co-authored a book titled Pain, the gift nobody wants. Think about that. He made the point there that pain is actually a gift that allows people to know when something is wrong so that we can address it. Dr. Brand was quoted as saying this, quote, I cannot think of a greater gift that I could give uh, to my leprosy patients than pain, end quote. Because for leprosy patients, think about it. Once the warning system of pain and feeling and sensation was lost, all kinds of problems arose. 
Once the nerves were damaged, the result was numbness, a sort of anesthetic where you couldn't feel pain anymore or sensation when you hurt yourself. There are recorded cases of patients who've had their fingers eaten when asleep by rats and being unaware of the fact that they're being chewed upon like that because they don't have any, there's numbness. There's, there's, it's almost like an anesthetic for leprosy patients. You could scratch your body and not feel it and scratch away pieces of, of flesh without feeling this because of the numbness, the numbing effects of leprosy. You were easily susceptible to physical injury, unintentional trauma, burns, bumps, secondary infections, etc. And these injuries led to severe skin damage and eye problems, um, damaging of the earlobes. The thin tissue lining inside of the nose was damaged so that you could have severe inflammation that would arise in those areas of the face. You could develop facial deformities then. In really severe patients, there was even after time uh, of having leprosy, even the loss of limbs, the decaying of, of the tips of your toes or of your fingers. I mean, this was a devastating disease. The vocal cords would be attacked as well so that your voice would, would sound like a dog growling or howling. You had a hoarse voice. Think about that. You know, we just, the world just celebrated Halloween with all of its horrors and all of that, right? And one of the things that attracts people is, is, is face masks and, and costumes of witches and, and, and dead corpses and all of that. We had a neighbor across the street from us who, who just decked out his front yard. For four weekends, he spent just time putting out corpses in the front and, and, and tombs and all kinds of witches and all kinds of crazy things up there to create terror and horror in people because they have fun looking at those things, right? Well, think about in the New Testament, lepers being that way or being perceived that way as people that were horrifying. Lepers were not lovely people to look at. In fact, if you ever want to get an idea of what leprosy looks like, just Google it sometime. Google it sometime. Don't do it right now, right? <laughs> Everybody's head goes down and the lights come on. <laughs> you know, those cases may not be the, the same exact cases of severe leprosy in the New Testament, but you get an idea of, of the horrifying effects and the horrifying disease that leprosy is. But beloved, if the condition wasn't enough, as if the condition wasn't enough, imagine the stigma that came with the person who was a leper. You know, at the time, there was no known cure for leprosy, and it was believed to be highly contagious in, uh, during Jesus' time and in the Old Testament as well. So much so that Leviticus chapters 13 and 14 are two full chapters that are, that are giving specific instructions about A, how to detect leprosy in a person by the priests at the, in, in that day who were concerned with the spiritual cleanliness of every single person so that they might come before God and, 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 and worship, but also two, what to do with a person who once examined was confirmed to have leprosy. And if after examined by a priest and confirmed to have leprosy, that person was pronounced by that priest ceremonially, ceremonially unclean, there was a great stigma that came upon that person. Just listen to Leviticus chapter 13, verses 44 to 46, which speak concerning the confirmed case of leprosy. The priest shall surely pronounce him, that is the leper, unclean. His infection is on his head, as for the leper who has the infection, his clothes, listen, shall be torn, and the hair of his head shall be uncovered, that is, disheveled. And he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. In other words, he needed to single himself out. Not only look terrible, right? Show that, but also single himself out or herself out. He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. That is in isolation. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. These people were ostracized from society. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine the humiliation and the, and the sense of shame and ridicule being in that condition brought about? I mean, what if you were to be examined in our context today and you were, and you were um, confirmed that you had a, a, a disease that if you were around other people, you would, um, they would contract the same disease. So you needed to, when you went to Ralph's, when you went to CVS here nearby, or when you went to Costco, right, where everybody's bumping each other into each other, Whenever you went to these places, or maybe the mall for some of you teens, right? Wherever you hang out, 
if you had to look disheveled, look messy, and you had to shout in every single one of these places, unclean, unclean, what would that be like for you? How would that go? Imagine that. Everybody would look upon you as an object of humiliation and ridicule and shame, right? You'd feel singled out. But that was exactly the point, beloved. For the protection of other people, you had to shout these things and look that way so that people would not be infected by you. To make matters worse, in addition to those things, as pronounced by the priest in Leviticus 13 and 14, by Jesus' time, rabbinical teaching added restrictions concerning lepers. If a leper even stuck their head inside of a building or a house, even if, if away far from people, he was pronounced unclean and punished. Even if he was keeping a safe distance. If, if it, became, it became illegal even to say hi or to greet a leper or acknowledge him or her in those days. People just shunned you. And in some cases, 40 lashes were given to lepers who did not maintain a far distance from people, even if inadvertently they did that. They were severely punished, even at times for no infraction at all. You were the object of ridicule, of shame. People ostracized you. The Jewish historian Josephus, writing in the first century, says that lepers were treated, quote, as if they were, in effect, dead men, in no way differing from a corpse, end quote. Certain rabbis would refer to lepers as the living dead, the living dead. So for all intents and purposes, they were non-existent and ignored. People were indifferent to them. They were, their condition was devastating, but the stigma was even worse. It was humiliating. They were isolated, social outcasts, ostracized from their families, from society, and even the worshiping community. Think about that. How would you feel in that situation? This background of leprosy and those who contracted that is the reason why, beloved, the actions of this leper are so shocking and so outrageous, right? So shocking and so outrageous. Notice the boldness and the determination of this man. In verse 40, it says that a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him and saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Matthew 8, by the way, the parallel account says that he worshiped Jesus, even calling him Lord. So this man comes in humble, and with a humble posture, with reverence and respect for Jesus, even addressing him as master. Whether he fully understood who Jesus was, we don't know. But he was addressing him with the title of reverence and respect, worshiping him. This leper was to stand at a safe distance in order not to contaminate Jesus, but he's so desperate, he's so desperate, and he's so hopeful that he humbly and unashamedly falls at the feet of Jesus, pleading for his help. No personal pride. He doesn't question Jesus' ability to help. He knows that Jesus is powerful, that he has authority, he has heard and maybe witnessed some of the healings, but he knows that it's up to Jesus. If he wants to do it, he can. If you are willing you can make me clean. This is a shocking, shocking approach by this leper, isn't it? But even more shocking, beloved, is Jesus' response, isn't it? In verse 41, unlike the rabbis who avoided such people and who were indifferent to such people and were so hateful towards those people, Jesus is more than willing to help, isn't he? Secondly, we see the Lord's pity, the Lord's pity. We saw the leper's plight, now see the Lord's pity in verses 41 and 42. Moved with compassion, it says in verse 41. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Listen, while crowds must have been horrified at the sight of this man here, who probably looked horrible as well, Jesus' attitude, beloved, note in verse 41 is that he's moved with compassion. This word compassion here appears in the, in the Gospels and it's only seen as com the compassion that Jesus Christ displays towards others with the exception of a couple of parables. This is Jesus' compassion in the Gospels. It's the compassion that, we, that we're going to see later on in Mark chapter 6, verse 34. 
during the feeding of the 5,000, where it says that Jesus saw the crowds and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep having no shepherd. Jesus feels compassion. It has to do with tender pity. Felt in the gut, literally. It was a gut-wrenching compassion. It emphasizes how Jesus would genuinely, listen, feel from within the pain of people made in the image of God. This kind of compassion. Jesus would put himself, beloved, being the Lord of the universe, in people's situation. He understood and could identify or wanted to identify with the, with the brokenness of humanity on earth. And so he feels compassion for him. And we see how, again, our Lord, far from indifferent, distant, or careless toward people's needs, genuinely cared for people who were made in the image of God. And listen, it was real. It was heartfelt compassion, beloved. Jesus didn't come to earth and display compassion towards people or tender pity towards people as a publicity scam so that people can say, oh, for all these records of this one who came to earth, wow, he was so compassionate and it wasn't real from within his heart. Jesus came with genuine compassion and genuine pity towards people, didn't he? I recall once taking a group of people to the Dominican Republic, um, big money people, mostly believers, but some non-believers, and amongst these non-believers were, were two moms and their daughters who were big-time actresses, 10 and 12 years old. And they became pretty popular actresses in the years to follow after 2008 when I took them there. And I took these people to the Dominican Republic, to a, 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 in the Dominican Republic, but a Haitian community where Haitian children were brought in to some of these schools to be cared for, and some of these kids were orphans, or some of them came from very poverty-stricken families. And so we went to visit one of these schools. And as we're there with these donors, these people, we're trying to, to show them what, what, what the churches were doing, the local churches were doing there to care for some of these kids. And so everybody's going around spending time with them, and we had little projects for them, and we had candy for the kids and all of that. And I'll never forget this. One of the mothers of the 10-year-old little actress comes up to me with a frustrated look and gets in my face and says, Kempis, I thought that we would see little black Haitian kids today. And I looked at her almost in disbelief. And I said, what do you mean? I said, what do you, what do you, what do you think we're doing here? Well, I don't, I don't think that these are Haitian kids. And I said, how do you, what do you mean by that? And you know what eventually it turned, it turned out to be? That this lady and her little daughter weren't there to care for children because of a genuine heart of compassion, but it was all for show. It was a publicity scam. She wanted pictures of what she perceived to be real, genuine Haitian kids so that then people out in Hollywood could see that her daughter was a very compassionate and tender pity kind of a little girl. And she brought more popularity and more accolades to her role as an actress. I thought, what a shame. Of course, we had some interesting conversations over dinner back at the hotel that night. And I'm thankful that we did. You know, there are some liberal commentators that write about Jesus, and write about Jesus almost as if, for Jesus, this was all for show, just so that we would follow his example, strictly speaking, but it wasn't genuine. It wasn't tender pity from the heart. Beloved, listen, Jesus' compassion was genuine and authentic, wasn't it? He loved people. He genuinely cared for people. In fact, notice in verse 41 that he's moved to action. As his, as his affections are moved in compassion for these people, he touches this man. Jesus stretched, stretched out his hand and touched him. I mean, he's not supposed to do that. Leviticus chapter 5 verse 3 forbids forbid people from touching lepers, even accidentally, lest you be ceremonially unclean yourself. Everyone knew that. In fact, the rabbis would avoid even coming close to a leper, and many viewed leprosy as a symbol, a sure symbol of God's judgment upon people because of, of God's judgment upon Uzziah and Miriam that he struck with leprosy. So people would automatically assume anybody who had leprosy, we need to avoid because we're automatically assuming that they are cursed by God for something that they did wrong. That was the response that they had towards people in this situation. 
not Jesus, not Jesus. He loved on them. He engaged this man and touched him. You know, times have not changed, beloved. We may not face people today with literal, physical leprosy, but what is our response to people who are oftentimes afflicted? You know, many times some of us are very self-righteously judgmental that way. Automatically, if anyone is afflicted with anything physical, anything going on in their life, some kind of a physical, special needs kind of a person, well, it must be the judgment of God upon them, so we'll pray for you, and that's it. You know, we can have that kind of a response to people. Jesus didn't have that kind of response, did he? He was compassionate and merciful towards this leper, even touched him warmly. Or what about with people who are different than us? Or what about people with infirmities, real physical infirmities that we tend to avoid, that we tend to be indifferent towards? And again, we assume that something, they must have done something or their parents must have done something wrong for God's judgment to be upon them and that's why they look the way that they look and that's why they have the infirmities and and afflictions that they have. And what do we do? We're indifferent. We avoid people in those situations. We don't engage them as Jesus did, as the Lord had compassion on people who were made in God's image. Beloved, listen. Listen. We are so not Christ-like many times. We are so not like Jesus, the Jesus that we see here in the Gospels, who had infinite authority, unrivaled authority and power, but yet he used his authority to care for people and to reach out to people in real needs. We miss the mark so much. There is the deadly evil sin alive and well in evangelicalism and in many conservative churches, the sinful sin of partiality and favoritism shown towards one another. That is very real and alive in our churches. And I'm telling you right now, James chapter 2 says that it is a sin to be partial and to treat other people, elevate some people above other people, regardless of their upbringing, regardless of their background, and even their ethnic background. That should never, ever exist in the church. Amen? Amen. Never. In fact, go to James 2. Here I go on a tangent now. (laughs) I just preached this in Northern California, so we got to go there, beloved. James chapter 2. I want you to see this. Because if Jesus treated people this way, including those who would be considered social outcasts with such compassion and tender pity, listen, we need to be like Jesus, don't we? We need to be like our Lord. James chapter 2. You know James. James is looking at salvation from the outside looking in. What does salvation, a person who truly has been justified and made right with God, what does that look like as far as the fruit that flows forth from their lives? He's calling for consistent godly living in the light of the fact that you are a believer in Jesus Christ, right? You will know them by their fruits, right? He took after his brother Jesus, his half-brother Jesus. That's how James writes. Like Jesus exhorted people in the Sermon on the Mount. But notice James chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, these are believers that he's addressing. My brethren, believers, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Listen, you know what he's saying? He's saying, believers, my brethren, do not say on the one hand that you Know the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is your Lord, that he is your Savior. And yet on the other hand, you practice or have an attitude of personal favoritism where you are partial towards certain people. Those things are inconsistent. James is all about calling inconsistencies. That you are on the outside what you claim to believe on the inside. He says, don't, think, don't say that you have faith in Jesus Christ on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you are partial and you play favorites. And notice in verse 2. For if a man comes into your assembly, this is the the assembly of God's people. Think about this. Where this should never, ever happen. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? He's saying, what right do you have 
to play favorites based upon how somebody looks externally. Just because they don't have anything to offer you, you treat them less than the other person based upon those external things. What right do you have? He says, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? You know, later on and throughout the book of James, he keeps saying that there's only one judge and one lawgiver who is Jesus Christ. He says, but in you doing this and elevating some people above others in your assembly, the place where this should not happen, you are acting like judges, which doesn't belong to you. That place doesn't belong to you only to Jesus Christ, who is the one judge and the one lawgiver, right? You've elevated yourself to a role that doesn't belong to you. And not only that, but what do you know about judges? What, con- what comprises a good judge? That that person is just, right? That they render right judgments. He says, not only have you elevated yourself to the point of being a judge, but on top of that, you're a judge with evil motives, I mean, there's nothing worse than a judge with evil intentions, evil motivations. He says, that's what favoritism and partiality does. He's exposing the heart. He's saying, here it is. I'm going to lay down your heart in front of you, and I'm going to show you why this is sinful and destructive for you to show partiality and play favorites with certain people in the church based upon certain things of an external nature. Verse 5, listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is, Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? You know what he's doing? He's not saying that the rich are evil and the poor are good or just. In their historical context, it was the rich who were oppressing the poor in that context, right? You can say in many contexts of today as well. But his point is, how do you practice partiality towards those who are rich when they are directly countering the purposes of God on earth? Like James is sitting there scratching and said, how could you play favorites? How could you be partial this way? These are the very people who are countering the very purposes of God. They blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called, and yet you elevate them above other people based upon their external appearance, based upon these factors. Oh, beloved, listen, we need to be careful that we never, ever make anybody feel in the context of the church as if they are essentially a leper, an outcast, isolated because of their upbringing, because of their ethnic race, maybe because of their social standing or bracket that should never, ever exist in the church. If Jesus, who was infinitely greater, with unrivaled authority, can display this kind of compassion, genuine pity towards all people because of the fact that they were made in the image of God, then so should we. Amen? Especially for those of us who call ourselves Christians, whose identity is in Jesus, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. No one stands on higher ground than somebody else. When it comes to the cross of Jesus Christ, we all came in the same way. None of us brought anything. We came bankrupt with nothing, simply with an empty hand, and God saved us, didn't he? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration through Jesus Christ alone. And so therefore, we should treat one another that way, beloved. We need to imitate our Lord who engaged people like this and loved them and had compassion upon them Here Jesus touches this man deliberately, doesn't he? What must that have been like? Here's this man who who hadn't been touched by another human. Listen, and who knows how long? Who knows how long? He had not felt the loving embrace of another human being, and Jesus personally touches him. Wow. 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 There's something about how God has created us with with flesh and bone that is designed to have human touch communicate something extra to hurting people, right? There's something about a human touch that means something to someone who is suffering and who's in affliction that shows that you genuinely love them and you genuinely are concerned for them. And that's what Jesus does here, that he's identifying with this man. I've been to poverty-stricken areas, beloved, Many of them, 
to help people with food and with clothes and resources and medicine and all of that. People that were, that there were local churches working to, to help alleviate the suffering of people like that. But you know what we found out ultimately? That eventually as you develop the relationship with those people, they didn't even want the food anymore or the medical supplies or anything else. They wanted the relationship. They wanted to know that you wanted to come and you empathized with them in their situation. They wanted to know that when you arrived, there was going to be a, hand, a loving hand, a loving gesture put upon their shoulders and that they were loved and that they were cared for. This is what Jesus is doing, isn't he? That's how he ministered to people, to souls who were desperate and, and broken. That's what's so astounding, beloved, about Jesus' love and compassion. And isn't this, by the way, what Jesus did in his incarnation for sinners? Think about it. Could he not have done things a different way and saved people, uh, people for himself? How did the eternal son of God, according to God's eternal, the father's eternal plan with his son and the spirit, how did he choose to come and die for sinners? He came in human flesh, wrapping himself in humanity. Think about that. I'm just astounded by that. That Jesus, that's how, that, that's how they chose to come, that's how he chose to come and die for sinners in human flesh. Clothing himself with humanity, entering our spiritual decadence, beloved, that we might be redeemed, bought out of slavery to sin for himself. He did it by coming to earth. This is why we love Isaiah 53, don't we? Our griefs he bore. Our sorrows he carried. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Our chastening fell upon him. He suffered for us, beloved, in our place during the incarnation. Wow. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's the great exchange. Our sin placed upon Jesus, his righteousness placed upon us. Oh, how Jesus identified and loved sinners, didn't he? Oh, how he loved sinners. Here is Jesus touching this foul-smelling, flesh-decaying leper, beloved, but can I just remind us that this illustrates what God has done for each and every one of us in a spiritual sense, right? In our spiritual decadence, we might not be those who will ever suffer from leprosy, but weren't we, in a sense, spiritual lepers? Unworthy, unlovely, unwanted, spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins, alienated from the life of God. And what did God do for us? He stepped in and loved us, didn't he? And sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We were spiritual lepers. But Jesus touched us, each one of us, personally, rescued us, and forgave us, didn't he? Jesus loves sinners. Jesus is compassionate. He both touches this man and reassures him with his words. Look at the end of verse 41. And he said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. He chose to help this man. And he simply commands this man to be cleansed, showing that his, that his words are definitive. They have total power over human disease. Simply by uttering mere words, he heals this man. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. The overwhelming power and authority of Jesus is seen here in that this man is instantaneously and completely healed of his leprosy. Look at verse 42. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Listen, there are now medications to alleviate and help suffering people with different conditions that we might say are leprous conditions, but that takes some time, six to 12 months in most cases. Jesus here, who has unrivaled authority and power, immediately and completely restores this man inside and out. No more bacteria, no more nerve damage, no more external rotting, deformity, decaying flesh. This man is completely healed by the great divine healer. What power. There is nothing that Jesus can't do in the gospel of Mark. Nothing. 
Absolutely nothing. That is why it's so key and so important that if you're listening to this and you're not a believer, you need to understand that the greatest miracle that Jesus came to do, if he could heal a leper, he could heal you of your spiritual death. He can save you. There's no sin that you've committed that he cannot save you from. None. He is more than able to do that. Well, we've seen the leper's plight, the Lord's pity. Notice thirdly, the Lord's instruction. The Lord's instruction in verses 43 and 44. And he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. Verse 44, and he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. Jesus here gives an, both an exhortation and an encouragement to this man in the light of the healing of this leper. And he uses very strong language first and foremost here in this exhortation of, or warning similar to how he spoke to the demon in chapter 1 verse 25 when he told the demon, he forbid the demon from speaking about Jesus, about Jesus' identity. He essentially does the same thing for, to this healed man here. He warns him to not speak to anyone about this, to not publicize this. Why? Because Jesus, beloved, doesn't want this miracle publicized so that more attention is drawn to him, thus hindering his preaching of the kingdom, which is his priority, right? Chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. His priority is to preach the, the kingdom of God. Jesus knew the crowds were fickle. Jesus knew the crowds were enamored by signs and wonders. And so Jesus doesn't want people to misunderstand the miracles and miss the point of the miracles, namely his identity, right? Those miracles validated who he was and what he came to do. And if those people truly from the heart understood, understood who he was and believed in him, that they can be a part of a kingdom someday where all suffering, including leprosy, including paralytics, and all of that doesn't exist, right? He doesn't want anything to detract away from that message that is to be embraced, so he warns him not to publicize this, but notice he also encourages him, verse 44, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. You see, the religious leaders back in Jerusalem already knew about Jesus. He had already cleansed the temple one time. That's in John chapter two, verses 13 and following. And they were already hostile to Jesus. They were already accusing him as a rebel antagonist in the temple. They were already accusing him of being anti-Mosaic law. But here Jesus in his encouragement to this leper shows that he's not against the temple and he's certainly not against the law of God, the law of Moses. He shows this by instructing this man to follow the things, notice, which Moses commanded. What things? Those things in Leviticus chapter 14, Right? He was to show himself to the priest. He was to be inspected by the priest and once confirmed clean to present the offerings that were required of him. And what would happen once he did this? If the priest examined him and he was pronounced clean, then he would no longer be a social outcast ostracized from society, right? And also the priests would know that Jesus was a law-abiding man, a man who came to fulfill the law, as he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, right? This was to be a testimony to these priests. Well, we don't know if this man ever went to Jerusalem to do this before the priest, but we do know that he didn't heed Jesus' warning, right? Not to publicize this. We've seen the leper's plight, the Lord's pity, the Lord's command. Notice in verse 45, the leper's disobedience leper's disobedience but he went out and began to proclaim it that is the healing freely that is unhindered and he was continually doing this and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere you know why this is so significant that Mark actually records this because we might look at all of the encouragements and exhortations of Jesus to various people, including demons, to keep quiet about his identity and be like, you know, what, what was Jesus' deal? Why did he keep telling people to be quiet? I mean, these people were, they were amazed at the work that he was doing in and through them. They were amazed at the fact that they were healed. Why did he continue to do this? Mark tells us by recording this that Jesus' concerns were legitimate, weren't they? Legitimate. Here's the big deal. This man goes out and does this, and now Jesus, from a human perspective, though not ultimately, is hindered from proclaiming the, freely the message of the gospel. And yet people are coming to him, 
and he was preaching and ministering to them. He was still resolute on his mission. But don't miss the point, beloved. Jesus' cleansing of the leper is a magnificent display of the Lord's power and his unrivaled authority, right? Validating his claim as the Son of God, the suffering servant who came to save sinners. The one who could heal lepers, the one who could heal paralyzed people, the one who could heal all kinds of diseases, and yet the greatest thing that he was here to do, and he did indeed, was the miracle of salvation for you and I, right? The miracle of salvation for us. And I don't know about you, but for me, being a believer, a Christian, it's a great comfort, and I hope that it is for you, a great comfort and encouragement that Christ, the one who fulfills Scripture, who is affirmed by God the Father and empowered by the Spirit, who overcame Satan during his whole lifetime, including his temptation, who speaks powerfully and does powerful things, healing people, shows his great authority over the demonic realm, over human sickness, including lepers and paralytics. Beloved, that same one has saved me and is able, more than able to help me overcome my sin, right? Not only did he save us so that we are now assured and secured by faith in Jesus Christ in our salvation and in the hope that we have in him, but in, uh, in our sanctification, in this ongoing process of becoming more and more like Jesus in the fight against sin, he empowers us. He's ever with us, isn't he? He is more than able. I don't know what you're struggling with this morning. I don't know what your prevailing sins are. I don't know if you've even made other people aware of those things that you're struggling with. The first person that you need to come to is your faithful and merciful high priest, right? He is the first one. He understands. We can come humbly before him. He gives us mercy and grace. The more that we behold Christ, beloved, the more we, that we are moved to worship and to trust him, right? To serve him and to love him. And listen, as we see Jesus here on the pages of Mark, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving very soon. Isn't it true that the more we behold Christ, the more that we should be moved to gratitude and to thanksgiving for what he's done? You remember the lesson of the 10 lepers who were healed by Jesus in Luke 17? He heals 10 different lepers, and only one of those lepers returned. Who was that? The Samaritan leper, right? He comes back, and he thanks Jesus, and Jesus asks, where are the rest? Where are the other nine? What happened to them? Only one came back, only one sinner saved by grace who was healed came back to Jesus to express gratitude. You know, many of us are like that. Always grumbling, always complaining, always seeing the negative in everything. We're not filled with gratitude and with a sense of thanksgiving for what Jesus has already done in the great miracle of salvation. As we Look forward to Thanksgiving, beloved. Be a person who is full of gratitude and thanksgiving for what Jesus has done, right? And the great miracle of salvation. Can I ask you who don't know Jesus Christ this morning, or are not a Christian, do you realize that if Jesus could heal a leper and do these kinds of things, that he can certainly heal you? He can rescue you from your sins. Have you repented from your sins and turn to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior? And let me begin here. Do you understand that you are a sinner before a holy and just God? That your creator created you to live for him and enjoy him forever, but you have done the opposite of that and you have loved yourself and lived in sinful self-idolatry your whole life? You've broken God's law. And the consequence of that is that you are guilty and stand condemned before a holy God, before your creator. Do you see yourself as a sinner before a God whose wrath is aimed in your direction? But do you also know that this God who is your creator so loves sinners that he sent his only begotten son Jesus into the world? And what did Jesus do? He lived the perfect, sinless, blameless life that you could never live. He was ridiculed and suffered at the hands of men and went and died on the cross for sinners just like you and I in our place for our personal sins. And you need to personalize that. 
my sins, my evil thoughts, my sinful motivations, my misplaced priorities, loving myself above God. For those sins, Jesus went to the cross to die for my sins. But what did he do on the third day? He rose from the dead, conquering sin and death, right? He did something that none of us could ever do because the wages of sin, the just payment for sin is death. Jesus paid it all, right? On the cross, nailed it to the cross. And he rose from the dead, conquering sin and death victoriously. That's the good news. The good news is God's love for rebel sinners in Christ Jesus. That's the good news indeed. And this morning, you can be made right with your creator. Because in response to that good news, God calls upon you to repent of your sins and to trust in his son, his provision for your forgiveness. His provision for you being made right to your creator. What does repentance involve? Seeing your sin? Seeing yourself as a sinner that you are before a holy and just God? Being broken over your sin, feeling genuine sorrow from your heart for your sin against God, against a holy God, and confessing your sin to God and coming to him and pleading for his forgiveness found in Jesus Christ, and making a commitment by the grace of God to turn from your sin, and instead turning to Christ by faith, right? Committing your life to Jesus Christ. Believing that only Jesus alone paid for your sins on the cross, that there's nothing that you can do. You cannot merit God's salvation. It only comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen? Amen. Only through Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for the unrivaled authority of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we are people who should be utterly humbled and awestruck by the great salvation that you have accomplished for us, Lord, for your glory first and foremost, and because of your great love for us. And Father, especially this morning, I pray that those who do not know you, that, oh Lord, today would be the day of salvation, that today would be the day that they beheld Christ, not just factually or intellectually with more information, but they beheld him in such a way that their affections are moved to see the beauty of Christ, that nothing in this world satisfies, only Christ ultimately satisfies. Oh Lord, do that amongst us. And for those of us, Lord, who know you and who call Jesus Lord, may Father, our view of Jesus continue to rise so that Lord, we might live worshiping and adoring and exalting this Savior, our suffering servant, Jesus. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Scripture quotations taken from the New American Standard Bible. Copyright by the Lockman Foundation.